Hello and welcome everybody to this session of protecting your endpoints and servers from ransomware. My name is Mike Weaver and I'm a national pre-sales engineer with Sophos. And this in this particular session, it is a, a joint a joint session between Sophos and Corporate Armor. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is, as I said, my name is Mike Weaver and this session is on ransomware. <clears throat> how to protect it for your endpoints and servers. So just how prevalent is ransomware? You know, the state of ransomware uh, was, there was a survey done uh, from the call, called the state of ransomware in 2020. And of that, of that survey, 51% of the organizations that uh, responded to that survey said that, said that they're, they were actually hit by ransomware. And of that 51%, 73% of them mentioned that uh, they were actually, it was actually successful, the cyber criminal in actually encrypting all their data. Um, so in a ransomware attack, I'm also, uh, I'm often asked, can, uh, what is the actual cost of a ransomware attack? And in a ransomware attack, it usually costs on the average of a two, over $200,000. And most companies, most small businesses, they just can't afford that. So they wind up going out of business. So how do we help protect these networks? Well, with Sophos, we have a, we go up, uh, upon the base of protection, visibility, and expertise. So we first start out with the world's best endpoint protection. And then on top of that, we, we add with our, our inter, on top of our Intercept X products, we add our Intercept X with EDR, uh, which stands for endpoint detection and response. And then the, which gives us the visibility. And then the last one, expertise, um, that is where uh, you can use our managed service called managed threat response. So that's a 24 by seven, 365 day managed service from, from Sophos. So, so what do I mean by the world's best protection? You know, when people often ask me, you know, why Sophos over somebody else? Um, you know, anytime that question is asked, most, most vendors are gonna stand up there and tell you that they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. I, I take a different approach in that I always tell everybody, don't listen to me, go look at all the third party reviews that have been done from you know, very respectable companies like SC Labs, Gartner, Forrester, and et cetera. And you can see here constantly, we are number one for having the best efficacy rates, meaning how well we actually catch things. And two, that we have lowest amount of false positives. And what I mean by that and why that's important is because it doesn't matter how much things you can catch, if you're catching things that are actually legitimate and marking it as bad. So that's what a false positive is, marking something bad that's actually really good. So once again, you know, when, when, when we say the world's best endpoint protection, it's not just that we're saying that, it's validated with all these third-party reviews. So with the world's best endpoint protection, so how do we actually achieve that? Well, we take of what we know from foundational, meaning known threats, and we add on top of it our deep learning to help with unknown executables. And then we also have, uh, we also add in anti-ransomware prote uh, protection to help against ransomware, and then anti-exploit to help with exploits like fileless attacks. So we add multiple layers of defense. Let's take a look at some of these layers of defense in action. So first of all, let's talk about delivery. So from a delivery perspective, we wanna prevent that ransomware from actually installing, and how we do that is with anti-exploit techniques. Execution, we want to quarantine that ransomware before it actually get a, ch get a chance to run. And how we, how we do that is with our deep learning. Now, if however it may have happened, if any sort of, if any sort of anti ransomware or anti any type of ransomware has actually made it to your machine and actually starts to execute, well, we wanna stop that malicious encryption and roll those, and roll those roll those changes back. And we do that with a product that we have called CryptoGuard. So how does all this kind of work? So let's look at the delivery. So anti-exploits. So with anti-exploit uh, techniques, the benefits of that is that we are able to now uh, help block these exploits, whether active adversary techniques, file lists, or, or script-based attacks. Um, and because of the ex exploit prevention, we're actually able to help stop these threats at every point in the attack chain. Now, how does that work? Well, we do that by blocking the exploit techniques. And how can we do that? We can do that because the, the, the exploit techniques that are available today, they don't change. They're the same ones that have been around since, since all this kind of stuff started, right? 
So what it also helps us do is that we don't have to now rely on signatures to, to look at new vulnerabilities. So that's what we do in the delivery. We try to block those things with anti-exploit. On the execution with deep learning, our artificial intelligence engine, what this affords us is this allows us to stop unknown threats. So with our artificial intelligence uh, engine, stopping unknown threats, this allows us to do that without having to re rely on signatures. Why is that important? That's a great question. Typical or, or traditional endpoint protection as it started out, started out as what we called signature-based scanning. What that means is anybody that was in the anti anti virus, anti-malware, anti-exploit um, business, um, their scanning engine they had, the scanning engine used signatures. Those signatures told that scanning engine then how to, how to recognize vulnerabilities and how to eradicate them, how to get rid of them, right? So that's what, that's what signature-based scanning is. Now, how do I get a signature? I first have to get a copy of that vulnerability. So when something's released out into the wild, uh, any protection vendor has to get a copy of that vulnerability so they can write a signature to update their scanning engines. Well, with artificial intelligence, we don't need to do that anymore. And as a result of that, it also scales very effectively. We can now use millions of file attributes to help us to identify unknown threats. And as from a, from a, a performance perspective, this is a very efficient artificial intelligent engine. It's very rare to see an artificial intelligence engine known as our deep learning engine to see it under a, two, a 20 meg footprint. I mean, that's very uncommon. But our, our footprint for our deep learning is only 20 megabits. And then for the encryption side, the anti-ransomware, uh, we have two products here that are part of our Intercept X products. We have what we call CryptoGuard is for file protection. And then we have WipeGuard that is, is, that is used for disk and boot protection. Now, why is this important? Great question. When we look at, when we look at CryptoGuard and we look at ran ransomware, uh, you know, Sophos is not the only company that can stop a ransomware attack, but what sets Sophos apart and what makes us unique is once a ransomware attack happens in your, in your system, what does it take to make you whole? And what I mean by that is if by chance somehow you have, you know, uh, uh, an, a ransomware attack was, a, was able to execute and run inside your, your network or on your endpoints, it starts encrypting files. Well, with CryptoGuard, CryptoGuard's sole job is to sit there and monitor that device it's sitting on for any encryption request. And when it sees an encryption request, uh, it actually takes <clears throat> it takes a snapshot of that file at the time that encryption request is happening. And what that does for us is, and just so we're all on the same page here, we're not backing up every file on the hard drive. We're not a backup company. We're only backing up the files that are being requested to be encrypted. And while it's doing that, it's also looking at the 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 process that's requesting that encryption is it coming from a valid encryption a valid encryption product? And what I mean by that is, like Sophos has a product called Sophos Safeguard, which is an encryption product. That's a valid encryption product, right? Um, and but it's also looking to see what type of files are being requested to be encrypted because, you know, uh, valid encryption products do not typically encrypt program files. They only encrypt your 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 data files and things like that, right? So in the event that we actually see, hey, this is a bad process, we can kill that process. And now what, what CryptoGuard does for you, and this is where anytime you're looking at an anti-ransomware company, um, if you were to be hit with a ransomware attack, the question you need to ask yourself and ask that vendor, well, what does it take to make me whole again? If I, if I do get hit with a ransomware attack and some of my files do get encrypted, what do I have to do in order to make myself whole again to get back to that, that state before that? That ransomware actually happened. Well, with with CryptoGuard, um, it we actually once it kills that process, CryptoGuard will actually then roll back all the processes, or excuse me, all the files that were encrypted based off that process. Now, other other companies in the market they they can stop a ransomware attack, but then you have to pull out things like your backup systems to restore files. So you have to pull out the backup system, make sure you have a good backup, and then find that file in the backup. Um, or two, some of them rely on Windows Shadow Copy. Well, that's all well and good, but if for those of you who know that Windows Shadow Copy, by default, if you don't make any changes to the system setting of, of Windows Shadow Copy, that could be up to four hours old, meaning that every four hours, it's gonna take that shadow copy or make that copy. So those files can be old. So the difference here is that with Sophos CryptoGuard, our CryptoGuard 
one, it doesn't rely on Windows Shadow Copy, so now it just means that only Windows devices. So if you have Mac devices, it's not going to help you out there. So we work with both Windows and Mac. And once again, it rolls those files back for you. Uh, so, so that's the question you need to ask yourself when you have a company that you're looking at. If you are presented with a ransomware attack and things do start getting encrypted and that attack is now stopped, what does it take to make you whole again? And once again, that's the one dis distinction or differentiator of Sophos over other products on the, in the market is that our CryptoGuard does that automatically for you. And then WipeGuard is, is designed to help protect against your disk and boot. Uh, boot protect, protection, meaning the so the things like your master boot record. So that is how uh, the master boot record tells your device actually how to boot, how to set everything up, whether it be Mac or Windows. Um, the master boot record is what's used to boot that device. And one of, a lot of things hackers try to do is they write over that master boot record, so you absolutely cannot get access to any of your data. Okay. So so that's the that's the encryption side. Now, common exploit examples, ones that we see the most often, are the four that we have listed here. So we have credential theft, which credential theft, um, you know, that's where their hackers trying to uh, gain access to your machine by copying uh, your usernames and passwords. In a, in a, in a uh, example of that is Mimi Cats. That's a type of uh, exploit that's used a lot to to get your credentials, to get your username and password. And with credential theft protection, um, you can actually use things like uh, keep, keep passwords safe, um, but, but credential harvest attack, that is the one that we see used quite often. Then we have what we call code caving. Code caving is where the, a hacker has, hides the malicious traffic in a legitimate program, so they can hide their, their, their ransomware attack inside of a legitimate program. And what I mean by that is, as an example, you have uh, I E X E. So I E X. Uh, I excuse me. I Explorer. E X E. So I Explorer. E X E is the executable file for Windows Explorer. So what a hacker will do is they know where that file is normally located, and if they can gain access to your machine, they will they will overwrite your I Explorer. E X E file with their malicious one because it looks like a legitimate program. And then we also we also see the use of macros. So with macros, um, that's used in a lot of the Microsoft Office documents, where it's ask it's usually using things like PowerShell, actually having you know either a Word document or Excel document actually do something. So with that, macros can be actually you know can be uh, used maliciously instead of the original intent to help out with uh, with you know certain things you're doing in Excel or Word. And the fourth one you have over here is called asynchronous protection calls. And that's a lot like code caving, but the difference there is instead of act, uh, acting or, or making it look like a legitimate program, it, it uses a pre backs on legitimate processes. So if you ever looked at the process of running on your machine and you've seen one that's, that's used a lot is services.exe. So services.exe, that's a process that runs and with uh, with asynchronous protection calls, Instead of it looking like a legitimate program, it's now looking like a legitimate process. Um, so those are the common types of exploit examples. Now, there's a lot more than four exploit examples, and and with and what I mean by there's a lot more than four exploit examples, these are all the exploit technician techniques that are out there, and these are the ones that have been used for a long time, and they really don't change, and that's why it's easy to keep track of or to prevent hackers from doing things. It's usually when somebody gets compromised, it's because of human error. That's usually what causes most breaches is human error, or that it was caused by a human. So we also added a couple extra layers of protection. Uh, we also uh, we provide protection with AMC. So AMC is anti-malware scan interface, and it's and it, what usually what it, it's using is scripts like PowerShell and JavaScript um, by hackers to compromise your systems. It leverages the anti-malware scan interface in Windows 10 and, and, and Server 2016 and later. And the details that it provides is what's used by EDR and MTR teams to do that further investigation and detection. And we're gonna talk more about this and we're actually gonna see this when we do a demo here uh, momentarily. Intrusion prevention, sir, intrusion prevention system, uh, typically this is something you see with a firewall, but when a firewall is not available, as part of our endpoint protection, we do uh, we do still provide intrusion prevention system for them, uh, both for inbound and outbound, and we are using SNORT rules for that. 
So now that we talked about the protection side, let's migrate and start talking about the visibility side. So everything we've got to kind of been talking about now is part of our Intercept X product. Now we're adding on top of that what we call Intercept X Advanced. We're adding on top of that now our EDR. And EDR stands for Endpoint Detection and Response. And our EDR does start out with that strongest, uh, that strongest protection, that world's best protection there with our endpoint product. So it is you're still using our endpoint products. But now what we're doing is we're adding expertise, not headcount. Because a lot of times in order to, to get a lot of the advanced uh, search features that you can do with EDR, you usually have to add additional headcount in order to do all that kind of stuff. Well, with our product, it makes it easier for, for, uh, for organizations to add expertise, not necessarily headcount. And we'll see what I mean by that uh, when we go through the demo. So how does, how does the, the product, or what is typically, how does a product, endpoint product work? Well, typical endpoint products, there's that benign, that benign traffic and there's that malicious traffic. And endpoints know how to handle benign traffic and malicious traffic. What they don't know how to handle is all that gray area in the middle, what we refer to as the gap. And so traditional uh, EDR systems, um, you know, most of those companies haven't been around as long as Sophos has. You know, Sophos has been an endpoint company since 1985. And, and the difference there is that with Sophos Intercept X, we actually shorten that gap. We shorten that gray area. So the information, so, so when I'm doing threat hunts and stuff like that to, to see, you know, what's potentially going on inside, going, going on inside my network, with traditional EDR products, you have a lot of information that's sent back to you. And a lot of times that becomes too overwhelming for IT professionals. But with Sophos Intercept and with our Intercept X product and adding on EDR on top of it, because we have all, all this historical information, we have all this and, we, and we've been doing this for so long, we were able to shorten that gray area. And, and that's why it's important to, to start out with a product that allows you to, instead of seeing a bunch of information that we already know how to handle, unlike other traditional EDRs, what you see from us is a lot less information. It doesn't mean that we're not doing anything. It just means that because we're doing so much better protection in the background before it even has a chance to start, that's why that gap is smaller with Sophos. And it makes it easier for you as an administrator as you're getting results and getting information as you're doing these threat hunts, you're not over inundated with a lot of information um, that's, that you have to weed through. We do that for you. And as a result of that, it helps you answer those critical IT and security questions. And we can do that through what we call IT operations and threat hunting. So what that kind of looks like is when we talk about common EDR use cases, with EDR, if you have a bunch of people uh, complaining to you that Chrome is running slow, um, it allows you to now uh, identify what's, what's actually doing that by what maybe by doing a query to see what, what um, extensions may be installed. And if you find they have some extension installed that should not be there, you can remotely uh, access that device to remove those, those Chrome extensions. Same thing with software queries. I can check to make sure that, that uh, applications that are being used, that they're appropriately licensed um, and, that they're, and that they're approved applications. If not, here again, I can remotely access that device and remove unwanted files or un unlicensed software. I can even use it to help look at my network activity. And I want to check for signs of attempted breaches. I want to look for attempted failed logins and look for any, maybe any sort of active network communications from PowerShell. And then I can, and, and once again, I can re remotely connect to that device. So if I need to maybe isolate that device from the rest of the network, or maybe I need to terminate any processes. And then finally, um, here's another another example is being used in phishing attacks. So when uh, when a company is targeted has a targeted phishing attack multiple people inside the organization are going to receive usually like a common like bulk email as an example with a suspected link on it and this is what i said this is what i was referring to earlier that most of the time breaches happen because a human did something so in this case maybe on that email there was a link that somebody clicked on um and that and that suspected and that link has you know a malicious malicious file that that it downloads but I can now take a look across my network to see if anybody else has that file, if anybody else has clicked on that link, but maybe there's just as it hasn't executed yet. So I can, I can connect to that device and I can either isolate the device or removing those unwanted downloaded files. Um, and I can also terminate any suspect processes. 
So with, with other, other types of things of what I would want to do from an IT operations perspective when I'm looking for EDR, um, I can search things, you know, why is machine slow? Is it pending a reboot? Um, are, you know, are there any known vulnerabilities or out-of-date versions uh, or anything else on that device that needs to be updated? Uh, making sure that, you know, the people are following best business practices. Um, is there any devices out there that, that already has a file of something I know is bad that I can search for? So that brings in over our threat, threat hunting. So with threat hunting, what kind of things are we going to do? Well, threat hunting, we can have look for things as an example, like this. show me the processes that recently have modified files or registry keys. That's a big one. Um, we can also look for things like unusual uh, login attempts. Uh, we can look to see if there have been uh, any processes that are trying to make a network connection on non-standard ports. These are all things we can do by querying the endpoints. And as we query those, dev those, those endpoints, so we kind of have that ask, answer, and respond. So when we ask and we get the answers back, it allows us to respond with Live Discover. So Live Discover is a feature of, of our EDR product that allows you to now search and, and query across your, your, your network infrastructure with a lot of pre-canned queries that we have. You can customize those pre-canned queries as well as write your own because all they are is SQL, SQL queries. And I'll show you what this looks like when we get into the demo. And when you are searching or, or querying an endpoint device, whether it be an endpoint or a server, those, those devices with our endpoint actually stores up to 90 days of on-disk live and historical data. So if I'm look, trying to look at something that's happening now, or maybe I'll look you know, to see if anybody else has a copy of a file that may have been on their machine, on somebody else's machine from the same, you know, from the same type of uh, maybe bulk email or something, we can see all that information because it stores up to 90 days. And then if I need to react or, or respond with the live response, by, so after we ask those questions with Live Discover and we get those answers, now we can, we can respond where I can actually remotely connect to a machine and do any remediation that I need to do. I don't need to install any other types of applications to make this work. It's all part of the endpoint. And when I connect to that machine, I can do anything I can do from, from, a, a, a very, from a command line, which gives me a lot of options to do a lot of things from the command line. And as part of our, our intercept X with EDR, we get what we call our threat, we have what we call our threat intelligence, which gives us threat threat cases, threat searches, and threat indicators. So basically what it does is it, it gives us an idea of where to start. So let's look at you know, you know where to start is looking at maybe one of these one of these threat cases that came in from something that we that we saw. Then we can apply context. We can do things like, so let's say an examine a file in this case, and uh, we can do things like look, look at the machine learning an analytics. So by clicking on this, what we're actually looking here is, is we're looking to see how the machine learning actually made that determination of that this file was bad. And it did that based off of looking at the attributes the attributes of the file, the code similarity of other files, and then the, fat, the, the file and path on which it resided. So those are all the things that kind of help give us that information to know what was going on. And then allows us to take action. And as you can see in the upper right portion of the screen, I can click to now search the, the rest of my entire network infrastructure for this same file. And I can choose to clean and block it. So I'm going to clean it off of any other machines that it's seen on, and I'm going to block it. And then also add it. And when I click on the clean and block button, it automatically adds, adds that as a file to block. So any other machine that comes up that sees that file, um, that gets communicated to all the rest of the endpoints. And if they see now see that file, it'll stop before you have a chance to get on that machine. And with all of the searches and the results and everything that we can do with the uh, threat analysis, what this affords us to do is the ability to close those security gaps. So once we can see you know, what, what caused that, that, that root cause, what was, the, what was the, the scope of that threat, and we can see where it was neutralized and see how it was neutralized so that we can do things inside of our, our network's infrastructure to make sure that that same type of action doesn't happen again. Now, now that we've talked about the protection side and we talked about the visibility side, let's talk about that, that expertise side. So with Sophos MTR, Managed Threat Response, this is a way that helps you to, to, to find and retain skills. So 
finding and retaining skilled skilled employees has been a major block for a lot of companies. You know, eighty one percent of them find that it's hard to to not only retain them but to find them. And 54% of people said that it's a significant challenge for them, while 27 say that that is their biggest single challenge is finding, you know, finding skilled, skilled IT staff and retaining them. So with the Sophos MTR product, it, it is a threat response service. So it is a service that is uh, a led, human led that operates 24 by seven. We investigate suspicious activity, not just detection. So remember, that's what the endpoint is designed for, starting with that world's best detection. So we're, rely, we're relying on our, our endpoint detection as part of it. So when you use our MTR service, the MTR service still includes that intercept X advance with EDR, because it's that EDR, that it's our endpoint product which allows us to, remember it's on there for 90 days, allows us to look at that information, search information, and just find out what's going on inside of the network. And that's how our, our, um, our MTR team works on us. It's, it's led by humans. They're doing threat and hunt and response. They look at targeted actions to neutralize the threats. And then it's complete transparency and control. So the, what our MTR team does is we proactively hunt for uh, potential threats and incidents on your network. We use all that information to determine the scope and severity of that potential threat. Um, then we apply the appropriate uh, business context to those to those threats, and uh, a lot of times it also initiates actions to uh, to remotely connect to a device to um, maybe to to delete files that weren't supposed to be there or get rid of some uh, uh, application that that's maybe not licensed properly. So while the MTRNT investigates this whole investigative process. They look for signals as well as those that aren't there that we normally see. So once they look at the, the threat hunts detections and they use our deep learning, they observe that and then they choose to act on whether it might be you know, a, a MITRE attack or you know, based off of you know, time, frequency, or, or direction, it's, they make a decision on whether something looks like it could be a potential vulnerability or not. And that's part of our MTR service. Then, and if you have a customer or if you are currently under an active attack, we have a service called the Sophos Rapid Response. With Sophos Rapid Response, uh, what, this do, what this does for you is, if you're currently under an active attack, um, our Rapid Response is a remote incident service that is operates 24 by seven. Uh, you get a dedicated point of contact, and it's a fixed cost for 45 days of service. So, so basically what this rapid response is doing is combining our MTR service and our, our, our intercept X advance with EDR, combining it into a fixed cost for 45 days. Um, and it also includes rapid deployment of our endpoint product to, for, uh, for our teams to be able to analyze that information. And then after that's over, you can very easily transition to our MTR service where we're continually monitoring your network 24-7. Uh, so just how fast is that? Most, most customers are onboarded within hours, and the majority of our customers are actually triaged. So we help them fix their, fix their active attack, and that's, mo and that's done within 48 hours. <coughs> so we talked about a lot of things here. We talked about um, you know, our protection visibility. Uh, and, and uh, protection visibility, and uh, we talked about our Sophos Intercept X Advance with EDR, what our MTR service, and what our rapid response looks like. And with those, so with the protection detection and protection detection and response, as we mentioned for protection, that's our Intercept X brand of products. Um, adding EDR allows you to do the detection and response yourself, which adds the EDR product. Uh, to, if you want it done for you, uh, that is a service, but it still uses our Intercept X Advance with EDR. And if you're currently under an active attack, that's where you'd want to use our, our rapid response service. So I know we talked about a lot of things here, um, and we do support multiple platforms. As I mentioned earlier, we, you know, we, we have support for Windows and Mac, um, Windows Linux servers, as well as Android, iOS, and Chromebook products. So know that we can help protect all your complete all your endpoint devices using Sophos. Now, with all of that, let's take a look. So if you give me a moment, let me uh, pause the screen here so I can get out of this PowerPoint and let's actually go over to what we call our Sophos Central Platform. The Sophos Central Platform 
is where we actually manage manage this. All right, so uh, give it a second here for uh, go to webinar to catch up with me to start sharing my screen. And what you're actually looking at here, this is what we call our SOFO Central platform. And the reason why I call it a platform is because all the things that you see over here that I just highlighted, these are all things that you could choose to subscribe to as part of our SOFO Central platform. Now, obviously, we're going to focus on uh, our endpoint protection today. And more specifically, once I start doing some of the demo information, is to show you what actually, when, when something's discovered, how we actually take care of that and what we actually do when we create what we call a threat case inside of our threat analysis center we have up here. So real quickly, our endpoint protection, you know, that's obviously for endpoints. So when so Windows devices, Mac devices, servers obviously going to be for servers. Now mobile, so the first two deal with protection. So at doing actual protection, that endpoint protection on a device. Mobile is where I'm now actually managing mobile devices. So this means anything that runs an Apple, an Apple iOS, an Android operating system, Mac, Mac OS, Windows OS, or Windows Mobile, we can now actually manage those. So if you have, let's use Windows, Windows laptops as an example. So you have Windows laptops that you're going to want to provide. You know, I'm going to put our endpoint protection on there. So you're going to want to put that Intercept X Advance with EDR on there, and then use the mobile product to help then manage that that device meaning that um, so let's say that somebody loses their laptop if you lose that laptop being being able to remotely wipe that device or same thing like a cell phone it might be a personal use device but if you allow them to replicate emails to their to that mobile phone through things like containerization you would create a spot on that phone just for email in the event that they lose that phone or let's say they're terminated from the, your company whether they whether it's on their own or whether you terminate them you don't need them to bring in that cell phone you can remotely wipe that just that container off of there or if it's corporate issued a phone uh, being able to have a lot more control of being able to do things like wipe the phone completely be able to track where it is at all times all sorts of things you can do with that mobile uh, uh, with our mobile uh, encryption is is where what encryption is here for us is where we're actually using the embedded encryption that's already built into uh, Windows. So for File Vault and for Macs, um, excuse me, File Vault for Macs and BitLocker for Windows. And what we do here is this is a nice, quick, easy way for you to manage uh, all those encryption keys here. Uh, email Gateway is our email service. So if you want to provide an anti spam service, <clears throat> whether you're using a hosted, uh, online uh, email product like Office 365, or you still have, or you might still have your own SMTP server sitting behind your firewall. We don't care what you're using for your downstream SMTP server or service. Our email gateway gets those emails first, so we can now scrub them based off of the settings that you select. And with Sophos, I know we've been talking about endpoint. But Sophos is truly unique in that we're both truly an endpoint vendor and a firewall vendor. And right from here, so one central pane of glass, now I'm able to manage my endpoint products. I can also do my mobile encryption. I can do email. I can do firewall management from here. And then the last two real quick, Cloud Optics is a, a, a service or a, a, an offering that we have that allows you to truly see in depth what you have going on inside of your cloud services. You know, maybe you spun up, uh, you know, based off of the settings you had, it dynamically spun up another instance for you, as an example, to help with a workload. Well, if that didn't spin back down, you're constantly paying for that in the background. Well, Cloud Optics allows you to do lots of things, like to see where you might have some security risk, um, where you have, uh, you know, maybe some potentially exposed things that shouldn't be exposed, as well as the ability to do inventory. And the last thing we're going to talk about real quick here um, before we start talking about the threat analysis is Fish Threat. Fish Threat is a training enablement tool that allows you to, to, uh, to fish your own internal employees to see if they are if they are susceptible to doing those things like we talked about, like credential harvesting attacks, or if they you know, click on links uh, not really knowing where they're going, or if they open attachments, even though they weren't really expecting that attachment. So the fish threat allows you to fish on internal employees, and if they quote unquote fail that fish te test, you can actually then send, give them remediation modules to help them teach them how not to do those bad things. All right, so with all that said, let's get to the meat of the product here. So um, 
obviously under protect uh, endpoint protection on the previous screen, that's where I go to do all the settings for my endpoint to how I want it to, re to act. But what I really wanted to show you with the time that you're remaining and also give us a little bit of time for maybe some Q&A is to, is to show you the threat cases. So when something actually gets caught, a threat case is created. And a threat case, just to give you an idea, I'll just click on one of these. And with a threat case, across the top, you're going to see, first off, a little summary. It's going to show me that the machine it happened on, um, the IP address they were using, what the root cause. In this case, it was Microsoft Edge. And here it looks like they, they reached out to um, a website that, that had a file on there. We detected it, and then we cleaned that. And as I move down the screen, um, I get another summary here. Now tell me what the detection name was. So in this case, the, the vulnerability that was detected was called lockdown. And notice that it's an active link. And if I click on here, it actually takes me over to Sophos Labs to give me more information relative to uh, to what uh, uh, that that lockdown what that lockdown feature or, or vulnerability is. It tells me the device that it happened on, who it belongs to. Um, I, from here, I can now actually click to isolate the device. And when I click to isolate a device, basically what we're doing is we're turning off all network capabilities of that device. Because anytime you get a compromised machine, what's the first thing it wants to do? It wants to, it wants to, you know, proliferate to the rest of your network. So even though in this case we detected and we cleaned it, I still may want to isolate that device while I do further investigation. And the only thing that does from a further investigation perspective or when I isolate a device is it stops it from having all network access. It doesn't allow it to surf the web, but it does give it access only to the Sophos Central platform in case there's any remediation. I can click to actually scan the device. So even though it says it's clean it, I can, it, you know, as best security practice, maybe I want to scan a device anytime that happens. Or from here, I can now click to run a live discovery query. I'm not going to do that here. I'm going to actually show what live discovery queries look like in just a moment. I just want to finish up on this screen. So as I scroll down, you know, I, saw, I see two tabs here. One says analyze and one says case record. Case record is everything that was that's going on as part of this case. In fact, even when the vulnerability or when we detect this vulnerability, you can see that a couple of days later, I actually initiated a scan. And this thing that anything else uh, you are doing, that's all from information that I am, that I can type in here. So anything else I'm doing as part of this, um, this as part of this, case record, um, so in case I have to divulge to anybody that, that I was compromised, here's all the notes of everything that was done in addition to the few things I'm going to show you here in just a moment. I just simply click on that add, add comment. But I'm going to go back over to analyze, and this is what I find truly impressive about this product. So as part of our product, we actually get the forensics. So we're looking at the forensics of what actually happened. I wanted to scroll that out so you can see the entire, this is the entire attack chain, attack chain. this is everything that happened. So as I zoom into this, I'm going to look for this um, red dot here because um, this is actually where it happened. And you can see everything that happened. Look at all these, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 17. 17 different Microsoft Edge windows were spawned off as part of this. And you can see all the arrows pointing to it and um, registry key access. And if I wanted to see what that was, I simply click on that. And now you can see it shows me those 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 registry keys that were actually accessed. Um, and I can choose to narrow this down. It's kind of, kind of busy, right? So maybe I don't want to look at processes or other files. Maybe I want to just see maybe network connections. So everywhere you see where it says URL or IP, um, I can look at, I can click on this and look at the URLs that it reached out to, as well as I can look at, uh, click and look at the IP addresses that it reached out to. And in this case, I can actually copy this um, because I want to see if if any of my other devices have actually reached out to the same IP address. So so uh, as part of the, the the forensics that I'm seeing here, I'm going to turn everything back on here and zoom it out. But you can see they get this nice graphical representation of everything that happened. And I can actually click here to, to click a, a snapshot of that, uh, that forensic snapshot so I can download that. And I can export and I can export everything that happened to CSV. And what I mean by everything that happened, as I scroll down here at the bottom, you can see that um, it's displaying one of 10 out of 1,070. So 1,070 things were touched as part of this attack chain, as part of this vulnerability. And I can, and I can actually export, uh, export that to CSV. All right, so that, that's what a threat case looks like. Now, what about 
what if I want to now take and actively search my network for anything, anything other, any, any, any other devices that may have reached out to the same IP addresses? So I can click on threat searches, and in here it says I can enter, enter one or more file names, SHA-256 file hashes, um, IP address. So I'm going to place some IP addresses in there, and I can actually now click to search that. Now my little demo environment, I have like 10, and I know no research results are going to come back. But once I did, that's how I can now all those other devices. I can remember that that button I showed you that that um, clean and block. I can select all. Just simply put a checkbox here, highlight all the other machines that are listed here, click that clean and block, and it's now going to go automatically clean all those devices for me, and add that as a block file to all my endpoint devices. Okay. Now, but what's and, and I can do that kind of search by by entering in, like I said, either IP addresses, I can enter in um, SHA-256 file hashes, domains, command lines. So there's lots of information I can search for here. But the true power of this is the live discover. So with live discover, I'm actually able to now click on machines. Let me let me click a couple machines here that I know that are online that I can get fast results for, being that we are pressed for time. So I'm going to update my limits, I'm going to select two. And what we can do as part of this is with our, our, our live discovery, we have, as you can see here, we have over 105 queries that are already pre canned and we're constantly adding to this. When we launched this back in August of last year, when we, we started the, the EAP on this, we had 15 canned, canned uh, queries. We now have 105, we're constantly adding to this. But we also have a community online and under Sophos community where people can actually post uh, queries that they've done and you can use those if you see fit. But um, let's say, just to give you an idea of some of the things you can do, let's look at devices. And I'm going to look at this one. This one here is going to allow us to see the hardware and operating system details. And you can see here, here's my, here's my SQL query. And, um, I, and I can run this query as is, because like myself, I'm not a big SQL query guy. Um, but those people that have the knowledge, they can actually edit this query if they want to, if they want to take something out or add something to it, you can save it. But let's go ahead and run this query. So now what it's going to do is it's going to go out and it's going to go look at those two devices that we were looking at before to see, and you can see it came back um, with one, one of the devices already. And this device, you can see the device name. It shows me the host name of it, what brand of CPU is actually running on that device. Um, I can see how much memory is there, what device it's, it's actually, you know, who's the vendor of it, which version of Windows is running on it, which version, which build. So it gives me very detailed information of what's going on um, with, with that particular uh, device. In this case, seeing everything as part of all the information. But there's a lot of other powerful tools that I have here, or other queries. Um, as an example, we talked about looking at, you know, uh, running queries to see uh, which processes have an open network connection. So let's run this one. So I'm going to click to run that one, and what it's going to do, it's now going to go out to the, to the devices, and it's going to look at, in this case, look at this device, and it shows me the the process ID the path of it, which port, local port it's using, the remote address, the IP address, the remote port. Um, and so it shows me that information. So these are all the processes that actually have um, an open network connection. So I might look at um, a, a process ID or a path to actually see what that is to see if it's something that, that should have an open network connection or not. So that's the power of our live discovery um, within our, our Sophos product. Now, once I do a live discovery, uh, let's say that I needed to, I see something wrong with some machine and I want to uh, attach to that machine. Um, I can, so under, under devices, let's say that um, a particular machine uh, had an issue. Let me select a machine here. Uh, let's use this one to this is my machine. I can click on it. And you'll see here it says live response. So as live response, uh, maybe I want to you know, do a restart on this machine. So what's actually happening now is Sofa Central is going out and making a connection to that endpoint device. So it's actually connect, physically connecting to my endpoint, my endpoint device. And it's gonna give me a, 
a window here. So as you can see here, um, you know, back over on this screen, um, when we're looking at, at, at things about the, the, the system here, you can see here that it says it's Windows 10 and has an IP address of you know, 172.16.16.17. Well, as I come back over here, um, if I do, I should be able to do an IP config. And I should be able to get an IP address in here. You can see that I am attached to that device using an IP address of 172.16.16.17. And now I can do I can do anything that I have, you know, as long as I can do a command. So as an example, let's say I want to do a shutdown, but not just a full shutdown, maybe just a restart, a, a restart. So I can do that. And now this machine is going to do a go and do a, a restart. And that's the power that I have of using our live response in conjunction with the live query. So very powerful stuff, very, very powerful stuff. All right, um, so we have about, uh, we have about uh, 12 minutes left here. Um, I'm gonna take a few minutes to do some Q&A uh, if we have any out there. So let me do this, let me take a look and see if I can, um, let me do a, a stop or let's see if we have any chats out here. Um, all right, not currently seeing not currently seeing any any questions. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to use the chat window and I'll be happy to answer any questions in the remaining time that we have. And while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, I'll go ahead and show you some other things that we have as part of our endpoint product. Now, um, as part of the endpoint endpoint uh, product that we have, in addition to be able to do the live discovery and things like that, as part of our just our just our endpoint protection product itself, we have multiple ways in which we can also help protect your devices. So in addition to, in addition to your threat protection engine, we can also do things like peripheral control, where peripheral control is where you can control the, the devices that are actually connecting onto that onto that device. And I'll quickly add quickly show this to you. So with peripheral control. As I go to create a policy and I look at the settings of that, you can see here that it allows us to control things like Bluetooth, secure removal storage, um, optical drives, removable storage, uh, MTP and, and PTP. That's when you, somebody like takes a cell phone and, and turns it in and, and from instead of just charge mode, they also put it in file transfer mode. So we can do things like that. And let's say I wanted to block removable storage but I can also add an exemption in there. So when I click on add exemptions, it's always gonna look at everything that gets, connect, gets connected to any device. So even if, I'm, even if I'm blocking removable storage and a policy that I have set to block for somebody and they plug one in, guess what? I'm still gonna see it. They won't be able to use it, but I'm gonna be able to see it. And I have the option to choose whether, let's say this particular removable storage here, you can see this is a Lexar USB flash drive. And I can say that maybe um, I don't wanna make it fully like I don't want people to write to it, but maybe there's a file in there I'm gonna say they can make it read only. But now I can choose whether I wanna make this available by um, whether it's uh, the model, meaning that it's this uh, Lexar USB drive, or I can say by instance ID, or if you wanna basically what we're saying is, or by serial number, so this one very specifically. So instead of saying allow all, you know, uh, Lexar USB uh, flash drives, instead of saying all of the ones that match this criteria here, but more specifically that I want only just this one by saying instance ID, okay? And also as part of our, our endpoint protection product, um, we also, so when somebody leaves their organization, especially in this day and time where nobody's working pretty much from the office, we also have things like web control. So when they're not sitting behind the firewall, how do you still control, especially if it's like students, how do you still control um, that they're you know, what they're surfing. So that'd be a corporate device or whether it be uh, like an endpoint user device or like student device, I can make my web control as simple as I want it to be or as granular. So just to give you an idea of what I mean by granular, you can see we have these top level um, sections that we have predefined, like keep it clean, general guidance, conserve bandwidth. But everywhere you see, let me specify, just means I can keep drilling down inside of the application to become more and more granular to, to say specifically what I want to allow and what I don't want to allow. And then the last thing real quick I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you based off of time is I wanted to also show you that we can also help control the applications that people are using. So with application control, this allows you to define 
applications that you want to use. You can see we have a lot of categories here. And the one I like to use for demo purposes is Internet Browser. Because when people think of Internet Browser, they think of the big five. They think of Internet, Microsoft Internet Explorer, Microsoft Edge, Firefox, Chrome, and Safari. But you can see here that we actually detect 96 different browsers. And let's say that you wanted to actually, um, that you wanted to say that in your organization, you only wanted to allow Google Chrome. So I'm going to put that checkbox there to highlight everything, make it easy for me. So I'm just like each box. But I'm going to come here and I'm going to uncheck Google Chrome. Now, if I sign this policy to somebody, the only browser that would be allowed for them to use would be Google Chrome. And as we, as we, or as new browsers come out and we write signatures for them that we can identify them, um, by putting a checkbox here for new applications added to this category by Sophos, by putting a checkbox here, that means that automatically anything gets new added to this category will automatically be blocked. So you don't have to come back in here to see if we've added any additional browsers. But you can see we have a lot of a lot of category support here. Another big one that people ask about is online storage, especially you know nowadays, depending on what type of company you are. Um, you know, I can't think of any company this these days that does not accept credit cards as a form of payment. So if you want to keep people from you know copying. Uh, credit cards over to online storage places like Google Drive, iCloud, you name it, Dropbox, all part of here that we can we can control to keep them from doing things like that. So, all right. Well, everyone, uh, I don't see any questions in the chat window. So uh, I wanted to, let me go ahead and stop this, stop sharing my screen. And I just wanted to give everybody opportunity. I want to say thank you for um, participating and showing up. Uh, as part of uh, as part of this presentation of ransomware with both Sophos and Corporate Armor, um, everything we talked about today you can very easily order through and and use uh, Corporate Armor as your as your vendor that you want to use, and you can order the directly from them any of the products we talked about today. So if you want to if you want to uh, add that. Intercept X with EDR, or if you're looking at the MTR service, or if you might be under an active attack. Rapid response, all these features are, or, or all these products are available through, through Corporate Armor. So once again, thank you very much for joining this session and everybody stay safe and healthy.